So the bigger cell uh, is uh, what we are envisioning as the internet. Everything in there. How do we do the security? How do we do the privacy assurance? How do we do the access control? All these are bigger problems, and one needs to deal with. And uh, in fact, a good thing is worldwide a lot of people are working. So as I agree. So privacy, okay, is a, uh, as I discussed, is a problem which is as important as the uh, security uh, problem. So, uh, but uh, little bit I, I consider as a less severe. But this aspect uh, we are doing again with the blockchain based solutions, particularly data physical stolen aspect. How do you ensure? And then access control aspect. Uh, how do you ensure that uh, we are um, having good access control? This through blockchain based technology. Data privacy uh, that is uh, coming from many different ways, and uh, data privacy is because the data goes through a life cycle that is collection of individual till uh, going to PCB, then from primary care physician, physician going to the network of the doctors at the state level and so on, and then uh, is stored, stored somewhere. So the, uh, uh, in, in the entire cycle of data generation and storage, it faces uh, data. Uh, various types of threats, various types of possibilities to data and the amount of data and so on. So those privacy issues accordingly have to be taken into account and so on. And this is an interesting thing that is, uh, uh, let's say we are dealing with um, millions of people a uh, database of uh, smart health care related health record. Let's say uh, entire state data, entire country data somebody is having. Then uh, uh, let's say we are uh, trying to see, let's say in uh, this year we put all the data we have in the storage and in another year we want to see so that we compare the trend, okay, this year what, how was my health and next year how was my health. So then when uh, uh, this year data we are keeping and next year when we are checking, how do I ensure that the next year when we are checking the data, the data is the same data that I have seen before. So this is a reasonable problem in that direction that is how before we a doctor or a physician sees the data in after one or two years gap always uh, ensures that the data was the data that he or she saw before not somebody had changed it okay and at the same time it is the person x data okay that somebody's data was stored it's the same person data that is being stored so this is uh, you can call as a medical data authentication that will be for using first authenticate this data belongs to the same person okay so wrong diagnosis as well as wrong medication are problems of any healthcare system. I uh, have a lot of articles and there is a, re a reason why this is a reasonable problem. And as of now, we have not worked on that problem, but I thought I will bring to your attention uh, from somebody else. Well. Pharmaceutical supply chain is a serious problem as food supply chain. Okay. How do you ensure? I tell the students that it is a farmer dining table. Similarly, in the pharmaceutical raw material to my uh, medicine closet. Okay, so completely I can keep track of. Okay, and then before I consume a medicine, I'm uh, sure that I'm eating right medicine and I'm eating medicine which is manufactured by credible manufacturers. Okay, now with this pandemic scenario, as you can see. That is a vaccine, medicine, everything are big deal. Okay. And uh, I remember two years ago when vaccine came, how anxiously many of us are waiting. Okay. And uh, then that situation is a vulnerable situation. And what is the meaning of that? That is somebody can kind of uh, sell wrong medicines, wrong vaccines because we want it. Okay. <coughs> how do you ensure that is why uh, uh, basically uh, counterfeit free or fake free? Uh, pharmaceutical supply chain and uh, quality food supply chain. Those are related. Food and medicine are important and they essentially can be single supply chain as well. Okay, so many cyber security, as I was mentioning, security, privacy, access control, many things are there. There are many security, data, device, all these things are there. So <clears throat> several of my students obviously are working and we have uh, also. Uh, graduated uh, many students in the past, so some of those solutions we'll discuss. But a uh, lot of people are working in this domain, this hot area, and there are many, uh, this important area, and there are many things that can be done. This tells you the complexity of uh, virus cyber security problem that uh, IoT in general, and, uh, smart healthcare or IOMT in 
the specific health care fields. And there are a lot of solutions because people are working, thousands of people out of the planet may be working on the cybersecurity aspect. We can borrow some of the solutions. But many solutions will not work because smart healthcare problems are unique. What is the uniqueness of smart healthcare problem? Uh, the uniqueness is that uh, cyber, uh, the sorry, smart healthcare devices may not have enough computational power, may not have men, uh, enough battery life uh, to run serious heavy duty cyber security solutions. That is our challenge. They are hard problems. So cyber security in smart healthcare is a hard problem and uh, we have to do some smart solution as compared to or it is been solution as compared to what is being tried in our domain, a lot more things have been tried as you can see from this slide. This is not same as what is uh, authentication or access control, or, uh, but some of them may be used for healthcare or uh, medical, uh, uh, what you can say, or hospital service security, but not necessarily useful. But this is uh, NFC cyber security, which can again have uh, device security solutions in the smart healthcare, and this is an idea where you can have a cyber security of NFC by doing some sort of biometric and so on. This idea we uh, presented uh, some years ago. Similarly, RFID, which is part of the healthcare cyber physical system, can be uh, made secure uh, through certain uh, mechanisms, and there are certain answers for that. Okay, and. Uh, Starting from as simple as that, store your RFID in a parallel uh, case, which is many of us are doing, and other solutions are there, like minimalist cryptography and so on, okay, and uh, a killing tags, saving tags, all these are different solutions. This is a very interesting slide. What is the interesting thing here is uh, how do I ensure firmware if the people, those who are jailbreaking, those who are upgrading the electronics unauthorizedly? That is the bypassing the uh, uh, firmware, or bypassing the minor uh, operating system, the uh, embedded system we have. So, how do you ensure when you upgrade the firmware? The firmware is a good firmware, the firmware is authentic. As a result, your device is not compromised. So, we can have certain solutions, uh, as simple like uh, uh, comparing the hash okay, or uh, even using some level of off and so on to do that. Uh, Secure. Data needs to be secure. A lot of data, as I just mentioned, that is uh, imagine the data of a state or data of a country. So, where we are storing, okay, we need to protect them and one can simply think of encrypting. That is what we do. But uh, uh, this is just a uh, simplistic individual computer you can store, but when we are storing a distributed database, because uh, uh, there are a lot of data. And then we want to make sure the data is not leaked. We store all the data in one place in the centralized cloud. Suppose you lose that, it's a, like a one point failure with all the data gone. So it will be distributed and decentralized passing better. And then how to ensure in the distributed fashion when you're keeping the data there, so you can so on. Okay, those are important challenges. But a simple solution like this for individual computers are okay. But when in that computation is happening, okay, data goes to some sort of uh, temporary memory, RAM and so on. Okay, and there one can steal data. Okay, and how to ensure that is you not know, stolen when the computation uh, is happening on the fly. So this answer we gave here that is how to protect the main memory itself, uh, that data uh, protecting when computation is happening. This is the device security. Okay, that another group where we did and. Uh, and I thought of sharing with you. That is, uh, they have demonstrated that uh, how insulin pump can be hacked uh, in a passive person in active person. Then they develop a solution, a rolling code in code, they call it that solution. And uh, through that uh, solution mechanism, they said, okay, you are using pump is equal. So that's uh, a good solution. Okay. And uh, we have developed uh, different solutions for the same problem, which are pop based and then you are mutual authenticating through pop and so on. Privacy with blockchain. This paper I have provided Bill Carter's and people tried 2018 around uh, four years down the line. That time blockchain uh, uh, was getting a lot of attention people tried and uh, this is a reasonable solution but uh, scalable data that is using blockchain 
to store the data on the blockchain is a challenge and then uh, how to scale so that the blockchain scales to millions of uh, data that we're storing is a challenge and uh, how to ensure the privacy aspects. Okay, so these are uh, problems many of uh, many of the students are handling and some have some interesting solutions. So what is there in place has have a lot of drawbacks. Okay, for example, uh, like uh, we feel the solutions uh, that we have are working, and, uh, but uh, not, nothing is perfect, of course. And uh, which, uh, if we want to solve, let us say, confidential aspect with uh, the symmetric group, it has certain advantages, it has certain disadvantages. Suppose you want to have authentication uh, solution to pop, it has certain advantages, disadvantages. Pop may be high speed, low power, but it can have a challenges, for example. And that's what we trying to solve. Then uh, suppose you want to solve identity privacy. Okay, so pseudonym is uh, basically approach people are using, and uh, it can have advantages of uh, discussing uh, true identity, but vulnerable the pattern analysis. So like that, many solutions are existing. They have their advantages, disadvantages, and research progresses. When you want to address those disadvantages, so we have better solutions. I always think, okay, why were we for IoT security? So when uh, IoT security we have been handling for last uh, several decades, the computers uh, came a long time ago. So IoT security, um, uh, what I realize is a very difficult problem. Okay, IT with a small O is not IoT. Okay? So it is uh, quite different. Okay, so now we are dealing with not just computers but uh, devices which are not necessarily meant to be computers. For example, okay, a, a device a for a smart healthcare, like a pacemaker or a, a wearable, okay, like an active tracker, was not meant to be a computer. But they have problems because they are connected to the internet and we need to secure them. So, IoT cybersecurity is a much more challenging problem because of the, the bottom thing I have written here is. Uh, Energy, performance, computational capability, all these things are affected uh, by some integrating some level of cybersecurity. And these are a variety of uh, devices and uh, special devices who do not have computational power. We want to solve. So, IoT, cybersecurity, that's why it's a much more difficult problem uh, to solve. So, when we want to solve those cybersecurity aspects in these, okay, we need to take that in consideration. That is, uh, battery is not compromised, computation capability does they do not have, they have to be safe, and size and weight aspects have to be as well as possible so that they are as comfortable as they were without cybersecurity features. With and without cybersecurity features, they still have to as good as other scenarios. So, when we see that is uh, like here the battery constant aspect, this is a specific example. Just make a check or a transmitter. They have it's very sad that the hundred ten years when this is less than ten years. So this is a clear. Okay. So, how do we ensure? We make them secure with this in serious energy consumption that we have to use. Blockchain, I mentioned a couple of times. Many of my students are doing, in fact, all over the planet. Maybe thousands of researchers are working on the blockchain. Okay. So as a blockchain is solution for everything, you may not. But when we analyze, can we use blockchain for the smart healthcare? We started reading details of it. To understand okay, what are the things that uh, we need to handle. So what we found that is uh, blockchain has many challenges. Particularly, let us say, to start with, the lack of scalability. So what is the meaning of that? When we have uh, six billion population on the entire planet, right? Okay, blockchain may work for hundred, maybe work for thousand, will it work for a million? Will it work for a hundred million? Then in your population is in the billion. So those kind of stuff, okay. then blockchain, it turns out, may not be as claimed, uh, it may not be as privacy preserving as uh, people are thinking. Okay, you may think uh, 
we use blockchain we have a bitcoin the original idea okay and uh, nobody is knowing no answer is no the people have and uh, then i found another serious problem that the number of transactions the blocks okay they are in the blockchain and so on then uh, if you want to store the data there okay that is not easy okay that is storing the health data on the chain okay is a limitation so how do you do how do you use blockchain that has scalable problem that has storage capability problem in the smart contract that is the research okay that is you want to store and you are you know it's not scalable it needs to scale okay and uh, then uh, you solve the problem of uh, data privacy data security access control all these things okay so then at the end if you worry about uh, the energy consumption aspects that is blockchain in their operational capability you need a lot of energy yeah, for the transactions okay so how do you ensure you have that kind of energy okay so all these are difficult problems and we have comparison here okay like mining of bitcoin and so on but uh, mining may not be needed uh, in the way we are looking at the blockchain in healthcare but this is needed that is uh, transactions okay and uh, uh, like uh, when we are making transactions and then some level of whether call it mining or supervision something some level of uh, things are put there in the uh, blockchain okay so all these are in its concern and uh, i found blockchain are very slow okay so all these have to be solved okay the blockchain can be the upload otherwise blockchain would have been all well deployed in that system it has challenges so it has advantage we are doing because it can potentially provide a umbrella that will take care of all the security aspects it can lead to decentralized or rather distributed storage and so on okay very good access control all these positive things it can do but it is not as straightforward that take the blockchain and use it okay so <clears throat> all these problems are there and uh, uh, in addition to that uh, 50% data that means uh, in a public blockchain if you want to do uh, the people who would have bunch of people who have a um, lot more computational capability can essentially control the chain okay, that's a problem so maybe that problem is solved by using centralized blockchain and so on okay then privacy issues it's a misnomenclature or rather a misconception that uh, blockchain provide uh, privacy okay. it turns out it is not the case one can easily find out the uh, amount of data ip address and so on and then privacy aspects uh, and the traceable uh, what kind of secret so anyway those used to solve then uh, other vulnerability which is a specific example of blockchain called smart contract it has a lot of flaws unpredictable state to uh, type cast and so on all to one and many different problems are there to one is so on this we wrote an article to discuss these in detail that is do you really need blockchain all the time and it turns out the answer when you need the blockchain particular problem blockchain that answer is when we have a lot of untrusted rather more all the nodes are untrusted go for it Okay, and uh, that's the best way to ensure when you are in internet, you are in the internet, and you are dealing with uh, millions of uh, users, stakeholders, okay, and uh, they may be not trustworthy. So blockchain is a very good solution, and it's worth doing it. But uh, when you are working probably in a private situation, in private environment where you know each of the entities and so on, probably a centralized blockchain or a lightweight blockchain is a better solution. Okay, so I recommend uh, to read this article. It's a very interesting article that we wrote uh, on uh, when we need the blockchain. Now, one can think of uh, the cybersecurity solutions. Okay, software I, I discussed uh, IT and IoT uh, security. Then uh, how they are difficult. IoT security is much more difficult problem. And uh, those security uh, attack and solution point of view, uh, there are two different things. That is. Uh, A software based uh, attack solution hardware based attack and solution so when you look at attacks okay, cyber security lot more attacks happens uh, through software because things are connected somebody 
from any part of the planet is attacking, then harder way solution are rather local, but they are very difficult. Why they are difficult? Imagine somebody has put a bad hardware, that means you have bought a fake test method, you have bought a fake uh, embedded device going to a uh, healthcare system. Okay, that is that's a built in problem. So I always say, okay, you have a very good roof, but you have a bad wall or bad pillar on which the roof is sitting. Then even if you will make a best possible roof, okay, your whole structure is not strong. Okay, so that is how you can visualize okay, that is the bad bad hardware that you have problems. Trojan is a terminology that is used to describe a situation where basically intentionally some design modification has been done. As a result, uh, that built-in weakness is there in the system, okay, uh, which can protect this problem. So those problems are there. Then solution point of view, software, hardware, all these things solution can be tried. Software solution impact probably tens of thousands of people might be working on a um, basis on software solution for cyber security. Hardware related less people are work because there are difficult solutions. And, uh, it needs a lot more effort to come up with the side of the solutions, but I recommend to have other the solutions because the answer is very simple why we have to do that. Uh, software based solutions, no matter how great they are, if you have bad hardware, hardware is open, hardware is vulnerable, no matter how great software based solutions, your overall system is vulnerable. Okay, so making good hardware and then putting very good software at the top of it. Both together can make a good solutions. That's the point one need to work on. Instead of just a great hardware, just pick something. Okay? So then this scenario I always think, okay, like our healthcare system now, you know, the distributed system making to this and let's say blockchain this and that are there. Then physical company functions we are integrating we have such a solution in that. But I always think uh, that when quantum computing really come to practice, maybe 20 years down the line, I don't know. And uh, then uh, quantum computers can guess keys much more uh, faster and a lot more, lot more the key cases they can do. How do we ensure our cyber security is uh, cyber security solutions working? So that will be their problems. And probably we will solve those. And that is essentially this diagram is a motivation for all of us to do research in this uh, maybe in the next decade to come. So this complex uh, complex problem we have to solve by doing something different. And what is the term that I use to make it a practice is what I call as a security by design. What is simple thinking in this? That security by design that means uh, it has to be in the design, that means we are all embedded system engineers or engineers doing the uh, system design, doing the device design, doing system organization software hardware together. So we need to always keep in mind what we are putting together is vulnerable to cyber security. So how to make it a habit to do security features right from the step zero of the design phase. Okay, that's the idea. Security by design. So, when we are doing the design optimization, whether from the cost point of view, okay, or intelligence point of view, safety point of view, all these we are doing the optimization. If there is no optimization, there is no design. So, optimization is a reality. We need to, we do not have unlimited money, we do not have unlimited resources, and we have to optimize. Okay. So, when we are doing this optimization, we have to keep in mind in the every phase of the design flow that. Uh, there is a trade-off and uh, security is considered as explicitly a design objective. The, the background of this uh, security by design comes from privacy by design, which is uh, many of you may be aware, general data protection regulation, GDP, GPDR, yeah. and uh, uh, it has a feature of uh, privacy by design, that means uh, data needs to be private, okay, and data uh, from right from when we are keeping the data in a system or anywhere, we need to worry that okay, uh, the privacy will be there and what features we have so that uh, they are kept secure. So this uh, kind of we can say uh, is the one of the motivation which led to we can call as a security by design or security by design. Okay, not just privacy 
by design which originally came for Tata and so on. Now the idea that means embedding security or privacy features into the architecture through hardware or software of various products, programs, services. Okay. And keeping in mind that retrofitting is difficult to impossible, particularly that is true in the smart health economy. Okay. Once you have implanted a smart health care device, okay, somebody has it in the body, you cannot go and modify. Here is a, a, basically another add on to give you cyber security. You cannot do that. Okay, that is the kind of problem we are talking about. So cyber security has to be a design practice, and the security by design essentially advocates that. Okay, anyway, there are different principles. This is essentially the original inventor who started a privacy by design. Okay, we kind of studied those literatures, and they have proposed seven fundamental principles. Okay, so we can say these are from the original inventors and uh, uh, basically we were putting in this uh, our uh, context of uh, smart healthcare and so on. So what is the idea here? Security of privacy has to be proactive, not uh, reactive. That means things go wrong, then fix. No, things may go wrong, let us have it. That's the idea. Then security and privacy has to be a default feature. Okay, not a explanation. Okay, you want it, then do it. No, it has default. It has to be embedded into the design flow, starting from stage zero of design flow, that's to there. In the middle, what I have very interesting is the optimization aspect. We are engineers, we are optimizing the design. We have a cost factor, we have an um, intelligence factor, we have a security factor. We need cyber security, but not at the cost of others. So I have to make it so that we get that without compromising. Okay, then end-to-end -end security and privacy throughout the life cycle, that is what we want. And what is there has to be transparent, okay? Then respect for no ethical violation, user knows what he or she has. And these are seven principles that is originally proposed for privacy design and I strongly believe and that's what I adopted that these are same things applicable for security by design. But we have to keep in mind, designing of the hardware, designing the embedded device, design of the software, Integration of overall thing, which is the healthcare fiber physical system, at each one of these design phases of smart healthcare, one needs to work. So, the trade off of cyber security, the energy battery is very important for our medical devices, and then the smartness, okay, there has to be trade off all these things. It's very difficult for them. Okay, so what can be done? We can, the security by design is the principle that we will adopt so that we, all these things are taken care of. And a similar thing, uh, what uh, around 2008, uh, I was talking about what I called as a hardware assisted security. Okay, and this privacy by design is in 2018 came. Okay, and security by design, uh, basically 2020, I worked with some set of people, we came up with that security by design. So on the other hand, this hardware assisted security I've been calling for 20, 2008, which is essentially the same thing. The idea is how to uh, ensure that hardware is playing a critical role. Okay, the uh, way the research trend has been, software-based solutions are quite a bit. But I don't believe that is uh, if you do not uh, make the hardware full proof, you can have software-based solution which will do a good solution overall. So uh, I didn't say hardware based security, I called hardware assisted security. That means take help of the hardware, you may have a software, okay? And in fact, uh, hardware, software, hardware, if you distinguish these three things, okay, then each one of them we can differently uh, secure, okay? And overall then things are secure, uh, overall system is then secure. So hardware security, uh, hardware assisted security, even uh, essential advocates, that is taking advantage of the hardware, that means use the hardware, for its own security, so as the data that it is processing, so as the system that it is building. Okay, that's the big idea. And that is essentially is a bigger umbrella of security by design. Okay, so anyway, so you can alternatively use the terminology, either as you call it or SVD. Okay, so it's essentially hardware is helping software and hardware software together is doing the security by design 
of the system of the device okay, and it is process, uh, securing the process information data whatever order itself of our system and it's not a simple problem again okay this has potential this can provide energy efficient solution this can provide uh, with some additional hardware led bit tweak you have very good optimization and very good security by design but uh, hardware themselves are challenging to design and hardware as you have mentioned here whether it's a digital hardware or rf hardware not same set of people are working on it Okay, the different expertise of analog design, different expertise of digital design, memory design itself is a different type of design. So these are not as straightforward, but this is what we have to do. We have to uh, do hardware assisted security, we have to do security by design. So then it has advantages of energy efficient, it can do robust security, low cost possible because it will add a little bit addition to the hardware itself. It will integrate built in. That is but is security by design, then it can, it will not have impact on the uh, transaction time and so on. So one uh, can think of to do various modifications to algorithm, protocols, architecture, even sensors that we are doing, the accelerator, the engines uh, for AI, this and that, all we can do, okay. Various alternatives, that is uh, how to go to the basics of the algorithm, that you can go to the drawing board, Back to the drawing board and uh, do different algorithms which are harder and that is better harder than or uh, very high quality VLSI design you do and uh, harder software together, co design, and so on. All these one can one has to go to the basics if you want to ensure that uh, we have the speed principle implemented in the smart healthcare design flow. So, for example, maybe we do better sensors with the integrated security on it and then everything needs some data, level of data conversion okay how do you do those data converters with security features integrated how do you do different accelerator with security feature integrated and so on so overall then we'll trust electronics if it maintains the integrity of the information consists the information works user knows what it's doing and uh, bottom two are very important everything done by trusted vendors and fabricated in trusted apps okay, all these are put together then when i see that uh, iot life cycle how we'll see let's say uh, that's what i'm telling uh, from device then different uh, systems then overall bigger system so we have to really go to the basics of the uh, basically design step zero of the design process on the conceptual phase, high level phase and so on, then in each one of those phase when we are doing various hardware, various software, various sensors, whatever, okay, we have to worry and we have to integrate the cyber security feature. How to do it? A lot to, some we have solved, no, but a lot can be done. But this is not necessary, that's why I put a question. Okay, so how do you integrate cyber security privacy at each stage of design flow of IoT or smart healthcare? So then how to validate in each one of those uh, things are working okay what we expected what level of security we expected all these things are there and then when we will see the overall uh, basically cyber physical system framework depending on where the device sitting okay sensing device put on the body or a, a device with a doctor okay or with a device in the hospital uh, and the data in the hospital, depending on each one of the stages, the security solutions and so on have to be different. Okay, potentially we can have, let us say, in the cloud, where in the right side with the hospital, we can probably have heavy duty encryption, this and that, and because that is a large volume of data, and that data will be stored probably for years. So that security have to be way different compared to the left side, where the user and sensors are there, data is come basically collected and sent to somewhere else okay that security has mechanism has to be probably lightweight and faster okay anyway so like that different things have to be there then hardware based security when we are trying to solve i was doing a little bit reading okay by the way what are the hardware assisted security knowingly or unknowingly use of whether somebody is saying has or somebody is saying sbd that is 
whether people call it hardware as security or call it security design, irrespective of that, what is it? Then I found this. A hardware secret model, HSM, these are integrated in the server, so duty that means this probably can be used in the cloud, okay? But uh, that cannot be used in IoT device, uh, that cannot be used in the healthcare devices. Then TPM is there, many of the, um, uh, like now the computer motherboards, and uh, you can buy TPM, no, not a problem. It has reasonable capability, and rather quite a bit of be used in the computational framework that we see in day-to-day -day life. Then in the bottom, what I put a POF, physical on clone function. Okay. Why I put that? Whether we can provide better security with very minimal overhead to the healthcare devices. That's the question there. Okay. And that is what the research we are doing. Okay. And then at different levels, for example, a TPM can be there part of the edge server. This is what I was mentioning, the edge server in the middle. Okay, TPM probably can be part of the cloud or even a TPM no, sorry, HSM can be part of the cloud. So these two can there uh, in different layers, but this are the end user level. At the individual level, we need better solution, probably POF. Okay, so that is, uh, then when I compare uh, POF versus TPM, they are not same thing. Okay, TPM is a full-blown thing. You can take it easily. It's available very easily. And uh, on the other POF is very difficult to design, and it is lightweight. It is low overhead. Okay, and it has certain capability, and we can uh, we have to take it and use uh, to generate hash, to generate random numbers, and so on. So it's a lot more engineering effort, but it can it has potential to do low low overhead security. Okay, so hardware assisted security, security design key ingredient can be TPM, can key ingredient can be puff. Okay, and we have to uh, puff has these advantages can provide hardware security, doesn't store key that brings secret features, okay, it doesn't store key, okay, when it starts, that number that it generates, that is the response, we play with it and uh, do various secret things around it, okay. What is POF with one thing, so this is the different circuits, okay, different circuits can provide uh, different outputs or same circuit can provide uh, depending on the challenge, different responses and uh, that we use for authentication POF. Then I was trying to find out what are really available in the market uh, as a POF, I didn't find many. Uh, this is one example uh, where a development board from NXP is there, which has a POF, SM based POF is there. So, uh, what we have done in the lab, we prototype POFs and using a PGA. Okay, so that is uh, one research uh, aspect actually. POF, different advantages, as I said, uh, like uh, uh, when doesn't store keys, it's low overhead, those things are there and this is a, what uh, a industry that claims to have very good POF I borrowed and uh, bring to your attention in terms of area optimization and other things so they are claiming advantages. Security by design, so I covered what does that mean. Now for a very simple thinking is, it's a design paradigm that advocates to make security as a design feature in every stage of the design flow. Okay so that what we can avoid retrofitting. You have the design, then go back to solve, solve cyber security, but not that. Okay, from step one, cyber security. So it's a lot of things we have done uh, in the last uh, five years. But uh, the original idea of uh, security by design or hardware as security, as I said, 2008, uh, that this is the original idea that it did to the nine, okay, that is secure disk camera, that idea was there. But uh, that is a single device level, and uh, I'm seeing that that can be applied uh, to that idea of uh, has or SBT to medical and this is a student uh, three years ago worked on this idea where we are uh, uh, basically embedding POPs, integrating POPs in various uh, uh, locations of healthcare cyber physical system. So here for example, individual uh, with wearable and implantable pops are there. Then we have the pops at the doctor end, pops at the, uh, uh, and those pops are basically uh, helping to authenticate uh, themselves. Problem is not simple. Okay, then when doctor uh, basically gets a dollar surgery and so on to, to uh, basically put a pacemaker like device which has built in security mechanism, what doctor has to do. Okay, so of course this has to run the back end. Doctor is not an engineer. Doctor is interested 
to put the pacemaker nicely. It's a very serious surgery. Okay, but uh, as engineer, we have done it, and uh, then doctor uses this uh, and the back end. These things are essentially running. That is uh, how um, somebody is putting a surgery. Then the way in the back end, this kicks in, and uh, certain challenge and response pairs are uh, there somewhere, uh, so that in future authentication can be done. So we did this is a full proof solution already three years old and uh, this complete solution is uh, there in the paper. I encourage you to read further. And uh, we did this with ring oscillator pops okay, and other types of pops can be explored as well. Then here in this context uh, that I was mentioning with uh, MNI this work, so similar idea but here we have used arbiter pops and uh, idea is uh, point of view is very simple. POP have to be integrated and you have to develop reliable security mechanism for authentication and so on. Okay. So in this example uh, of iGlue, okay, the other one is PNSEC done by a PhD student uh, who is right now faculty in Texas Roman University. And this one <coughs> is done by a student in MNIT with uh, Professor Romy Joshi and so on. And the student is right now faculty uh, in uh, BIT. Okay, so the idea here is again same that is how do we have a very good POP that can be integrated in the medical device and how do we ensure the protocol is established for future authentication and so on. Similar, uh, basically, um, I always say agriculture, healthcare, that is uh, food and medicine, they go together. So these problems are similarly existing okay, uh, in the agriculture domain as well. So one student uh, uh, just uh, last year started working on cyber security aspect of that, cyber security uh, that uh, so at the end uh, we want to combine these thoughts that is uh, as I said uh, food supply chain with pharmaceutical supply chain then uh, healthcare cyber security and agriculture cyber security all these are there are a lot of similarities how do we solve and how do then uh, basically have efficient solutions uh, keeping these broad prospect in mind. So the, the students uh, worked on a different protocol okay, and we have uh, uh, this different authentication mechanism with uh, different types of pops uh, for that and uh, this one works uh, in less than uh, basically second time as compared to the previous one which was taking around a second. So full proof uh, implementation with user interface done and this is a big idea and that is I'm very excited what I call as a pop chip. So what is the idea here is uh, uh, whether uh, as we discussed software based solutions are not good, are not good enough and uh, hardware based solutions are too rigid may not be uh, scalable may not be uh, easy to implement. So how to do something that is in between that's the idea that uh, motivation that uh, drove this research what is called pop chip. So where we are essentially integrated POF in the distributed network and then blockchain runs on it. That's the idea. And we have developed a different version of it to start with uh, the distributed network of smart healthcare where POPs are integrated. Then we are putting blockchain on top of it. And accordingly, different uh, protocols of authentication descent are there. This is amazing result that we found is uh, very fast and uh, at the same time uh, energy efficient, uh, basically overall. So for that we did various things, different protocols, uh, then different, in fact we went to the basics okay, to change the block uh, structure okay, so that we have something to keep track of the FOPs and so on okay, and then different uh, other th things that is needed in the blocks. Then when we do that we have to worry about the, again uh, how doctor will use it, okay, how uh, at the beginning, at the same time, repeatedly the doctor sees the same patient. Okay, so these different authentication mechanisms do be validated. This is doing again very good in terms of the, uh, as you can see, these are running in the Raspberry kind of uh, computing, Raspberry Pi kind of computing environment, which are very cheap, uh, around $10-$20 device and the power consumption wise, uh, a couple of watts of power supply. So, uh, a new student started working on a new version of that pop chain, what we call pop chain 2.0, where what we want to do here, uh, instead of the regular private uh, or public blockchain, actually putting pop in public blockchain is a very difficult problem. The pop chain 1.0 is 
we have done private blockchain and uh, that is where it's challenging how you want to do for public blockchain. The different type of pop and so on and to verify uh, things are different or uh, better than the uh, pop chain 1.0. So again, we have to develop those protocols for authentication, develop a new type of and so on. And what uh, uh, the student uh, claims that this is uh, doing uh, basically two level authentication and so on, it is able to do. It is uh, very good in terms of the randomness and so on. And uh, But I was a little bit disappointed with the time. Uh, so time taking is a little bit longer, but uh, the claim is this is more robust pop and so on. As a result, it's slow. So we will see how do we fix that, uh, maybe come up with another uh, research, that's how the research evolves. Then another idea here, which I like very much, which I think is a very good illustration of security by design. Okay, that means going back to the basic of the design flow and redo the design. The idea here is how we make those sensors integrated with security mechanism, let's say in a jar based or and so on, which are used quite a bit of uh, smart security, smart village scenarios. And, make built-in secret there. So this is uh, NIT Rarkela collaboration, yes. So this one, and uh, this is doing very good. So cyber security is integrated in that. And uh, another version of that we are doing, which we call it eternal thing 2.0, the name suggests that is uh, power is harvested. Okay, battery, it's not necessarily battery dependent and then it's a limited situation. Anyway, so this is a very good illustration of secret by design. How do we ensure data quality? Okay, cyber security key feature, uh, as I said, device security, device, um, <clears throat> then solutions to security solution, then data security, data privacy, and then their solutions. All these are uh, important problems, and all these have to be done in the smart healthcare domain. That's why smart healthcare security is a very difficult problem. So we have to have certain protocol and certain cyber security solutions okay, uh, in the uh, to ensure that uh, the data quality assurance is otherwise we will have bad models and we will have wrong diagnosis. So we developed some idea what we call distributed, a secure distributed edge data center and uh, we have integrated this is uh, TPM is doing the cyber security mechanism here and we are exploring right now another one student is exploring how do we do this distributed uh, edge data center with pop integrated cyber security solutions. This is a TPM based, and this is really doing reasonable, even though, uh, like, uh, uh, response time is reduced by 20 30 percent. I want a little bit better performance, and that's why this pop based solution probably will do that. But this, as of now, this is working, uh, and uh, that means you have different data centers being secured through our TPM. This is the idea what I call as a collaborative edge computing, where Imagine a scenario, okay, in a, we talked about AI, we talked about developing models, this and that, but people may not have computers, okay, a lot of data, so what, if you cannot develop a model from it. So the idea here is, okay, few people have low duty or low performance computers and whether they can work together to develop good models, that's the idea, okay, and that's the question essentially. So, what we coined a term called collaborative edge computing, where a basically light duty edge computing paradigm is working together, and obviously because they're working together, and if you are using untrusted uh, people, untrusted data center, you have to have security mechanism. Okay, so uh, that idea. So how do we do here in the collaborative edge computing part from cyber security mechanism? That, that one student has started working, in the, who basically carrying forward this, this idea uh, to do POP-based solutions. We have been talking about POP. Many of you may be aware already, and a lot of things are like I say, POP is now a 15 years old uh, basically idea. Okay, what is new rather is how we deploy it okay, in various application domain, particularly I mentioning in the smart healthcare domain. Important aspect of POP, it doesn't store keys. It generates when you need it. Okay, so it's essentially a circuit that is in a response based on a challenge. So we are essentially storing the challenge so that we get the response and we verify that response for various purposes. Okay, and uh, 
those randomness or the responses uh, are coming to uh, play because the way the socket is manufactured, okay, which is an analytical socket essentially, and uh, those variability that means uh, the uncertainties, the discrepancies in the disc in the manufacturing rather, it's translated to challenge to response, and uh, we use it for our purposes. So this big process variation in the, the lithographic process is causing, which again, uh, need not worry about details, just, just I'm giving the idea of those who are new to the pump. Okay, so if we see on this is basically a circuit level, so this is how that like data passing and we have uh, based on, because the process varies on the delay in various paths are different and those we interpret as ones or zeros and the ones or zeros are basically responses and we use that for our security solutions. So a single path, a single circuit with various elements will generate various responses or variety of pops with same input can generate different responses. How do we exploit this feature for cyber security? That's the idea. Okay, POF is not same as encryption, they are rather quite different. POF is very basic, I always tell, the way people are thinking to use blockchain for everything, similarly, a lot of people are thinking to use POF as cyber security solution for any type of cyber security, though it may or may not work, but that is what the research to explore whether the, for the application need, we have a solution using POF and what kind of POF I can design, what kind of pop based protocol I design, what kind of blockchain I can design, how I remodel or redo the design of the blockchain so that it is applicable for that application. Those are research things. Okay. Can any circuit become, but probably the answer is no. Okay. So uh, we can evaluate based on some particular merit, okay. particularly randomness to uniformity and so on. There are various figures of merit based on which we can decide if the circuit is a pop or not. Okay. So this is an example arbiter puff, it's essentially multiple multiplexers and so on, flip-flops and so on, okay. And then ring also pops and then uh, when we're talking nano electronic or the process of nano domain, definitely worry about uh, device level. So we explored pinpet based puff and uh, other pops as well, okay. So various topology, but various uh, circuits and then various types of device, those components are mix and match to ensure that we get high quality pop design, that means which is generating good random numbers, which is generating the same set of number, numbers repeatedly, and uh, other features or figure merits they have. So a lot of different designs, so we have explored the various different uh, device point of view, topology point of view, and uh, your uh, different architectures uh, with the power, different power objectives because at the end, we want low power design. And uh, this is one device we are trying, okay, that is called Dopingless a uh, few years ago, and uh, we had some good results based on that as well. So, anyway, so in the interest time, I'm just scrolling so that, uh, and then we explored your 10 nanometer design, 32 uh, nanometer design, and so on, and the before various, and again, which one to use depends on the figure of magnitude. This is one interesting multi key generator of how we can generate uh, multiple keys using sample. That is a very difficult problem actually. Then, probably, we can do hardware based multi key generation compared to what we are using right now. Okay, so anyway, a lot more details are there. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip those and uh, different. Another of my student recently did, uh, who is right now a faculty in Texas Roman University is uh, how do we generate POF uh, from uh, like uh, different principles and he was uh, uh, basically talking about uh, what is called Vedic principle, so probably there is some potential. So he says uh, this is how Vedic chanted those, uh, what you can say, repeated image or tones, if you can translate to POF, probably they are very good POFs. So he has demonstrated one idea here and I think this has a lot of potential okay, and uh, uh, but he's trying, and this was the first paper we did in that, uh, which uh, he has at least proven that uh, we can have uh, longer key length, okay, uh, as compared to a traditional design, uh, if uh, this principle of design, so that means because if, uh, well, let's say 128-bit key length versus 64-bit or versus 256-bit 
a bit key length what is the complexity of design that design complexity can be reduced if we go to other principles that is the idea behind going to what we call as the principles the lightweight puff okay so obviously various post processing pre processing circuit or algorithms are needed and we did all those and we have to demonstrate that design i recommend all of you to read for the details of that physical problem on a unclone function of pop is not simple to design they are very delicate i always say digital design can uh, forgive for engineers mistakes analog design do not forgive for engineers mistake pop design for the difficult okay it won't do uh, a good job on this would do a good design okay so lot of problems are there difficult to implement okay and uh, one needs the bottom line or uh, one needs a mix expertise of cyber security analog expertise and quality control to do a very good pop design so to train engineers to do a good pop is actually challenge anyway and uh, la, another limitation i found larger key needs larger ics okay so side channel leakage of pop is uh, as problematic as it is for uh, cryptographic hardware okay so that also have to be solved okay uh, um, uh, skip in the interest of time okay so trojan is to may be there further as well when you do, we are doing the hardware design and machine learning attacks are also there why do you fix those okay anyway so all these are there and this is what uh, uh basically comes to my mind while i am doing this uh, uh, pop based solution imagine the situation what i called as a doctor's dilemma and anybody who is interested to work on this uh, i would recommend to uh, handle this problem or tackle this problem so for example uh, a patient one went to doctor one okay and then uh, got the implantable done got the surgery done but then for whatever reason that is said that patient one is traveling in the another part of planet okay and uh, visits another doctor who doesn't have access to anything uh, of the original uh, cyber security solutions okay then what is the solution for the doctor two so that is what the point i'm telling so how do we have these security cyber security solutions which are portable okay and uh, essentially multiple doctors can have access and can um basically in the case of emergency a person a doctor outside the network can handle okay so that's i call a doctor dilemma in cyber security and uh, one needs to handle that then other thing variability versus reliability okay variability versus variability our design or what you call it okay so so far what i've been thinking like when i was working around or uh, 2004 to 2010 those 6 years i was thinking variability how it is that means what how do you do the design optimization so that variability does not affect the yield but now i am saying how do i use variability so that i get very good pop those are two contradictory objectives okay so how do you ensure i have very good design at the same time very good random number they are not same so this is another challenge whether i do pop using fpg or uh, or ic or acid design that is again another challenge to think okay blockchain we have done quite a bit and in the interest of time probably uh, like i will uh, skip those okay but i recommend those who are thinking of software based solution do uh, go through this and uh, we have one work called sir below where we have demonstrated a blockchain based solution can be used uh, in the uh, smart health care domain and we have very nice uh, user into complete design completely and then here we had proven another product called the blockchain where uh, uh, like uh, this pandemic tracking and other things uh, even during the pandemic one can travel and still can really certain information for example right now what we are doing when we have started traveling for example from us i have to upload my vaccination record in a server somewhere in india So I was thinking, okay, that's what this research was done. Of course, government with products, uh, it's not a straightforward thing that academic solution are adopted straight away by government. But this is a good solution if you can do that. It's a framework stays in the global under um, umbrella of something like UN and so on. And then uh, these data, particularly international travelers like us, data is there. So we don't have to 
uh, repeatedly do uh, all these uh, our vaccine record and so on uh, sharing. Okay, so anyway, so this uh, Covision uh, is basically the Globchain idea. The Globchain was done by uh, my collaborators from other country. This Covision was done by a uh, student in my lab with the same idea is how a traveler can travel out uh, anywhere on the planet and uh, all these vaccine records and that are uh, what you can say are in effective way. So, and she did very good solutions. This is currently a PhD student. Uh, we really integrated what we call as a, a off-chain story mechanism. Uh, that means uh, storage of data is outside the blockchain and uh, distributed. So we integrated IPFS and so on with interplanetary uh, so file server and uh, file, all these things were done, file system and so on. And uh, this is a full functional uh, what you can say, solution. Fake medicine, one of the I was mentioning, is a real problem. Contributor of fake medicine and a lot of deaths are happening and so on. And we need to solve. This is one solution. First, uh, you will not find many uh, researchers handling this. So we, are, we are trying to do that. So my current PhD student uh, has a solution okay, uh, called PharmaChain, where we have handled and of course a lot more things we are trying to add and uh, keep in track the raw material supplier till uh, the uh, retailer seller. Okay, we are, we are trying to uh, solve that problem and uh, so we are reading a um, lot more literature of uh, complete supply chain of pharmaceutical so that we can do distributed nature. Okay. Anyway, so this is a very complex thing as we understood like overall pharmaceutical supply chain is very complex. How, what things are so how do we integrate blockchain that's what uh, so in the first paper we have we have try to address and uh, this research uh, is going to be done in next uh, maybe two three maybe two years or so at least you will work on this problem okay anyway so another uh, thinking i want i thought i'll bring to attention there is a need for blockchain which is not uh, uh, which uh, should not have a proof of work kind of uh, protocol, okay? And we tried that, and uh, what we are calling that a e chain, where we got rid of the proof of work of the original blockchain, and have a lightweight blockchain to do faster authentication, which we think are much more suitable for IoT, and uh, that uh, we have uh, started this idea two three years ago, and hopefully this work will be done in the next uh, one two years with very comprehensive uh, solutions. And another student of mine, what he is trying to do, what he calls as a multi-chain. One chain he wants to store, another chain he wants to basically use that as a supervisor of that uh, next level of the chain. Okay, so we call that as a flex-chain, which is essentially what he calls as a minorless chain and uh, with uh, multiple chains uh, together. Anyway, so a lot of things are there and uh, I recommend all of you to read this is, uh, we can in the interest of time. Okay, so what is uh, here, uh, original blockchain, then a tangle is different technology. What, what we are trying to do is uh, something uh, what we call as a multi-chain scenario with uh, uh, what you without minus and that's what, uh, what this is doing. Anyway, so again this uh, I'll skip here. Uh, so those who are really from academia doing PhD and uh, junior faculties, I recommend all of them to read these few slides at the end, what I call as a research publishing best practices and uh, what we should do okay, before deciding where to publish and so on, which is not related to, of course, smart health. This is general. I just thought I'll put so that some of you may read this. Okay. Where to publish, whether to have conference versus journal, versus magazine and so on. Okay. How to do this and so on. Okay. So anyway, I recommend whoever interested to Okay, so anyway, so we discussed uh, in last two lectures, very comprehensive aspect of uh, smart healthcare, health care, cyber physical systems, uh, internal medical things, and now we know how cyber security, privacy, and ownership aspects are very important okay, in the, the smart healthcare domain. And uh, we have tried as uh, a solution security by design. Okay, a lot of research, okay, starting from pharmaceutical supply chain, various types of blockchain, 
various types of pops, device security, overall care, cyber physical security, a lot of things can be done. This is a definitely wide open thing and very challenging, difficult problem is what we need to handle. Then only we will have very good solutions uh, which can have high social impact. Okay, so with this I uh, thank all of you for listening to me. A lot of slides and many of you may be kind of finding overwhelming. Okay, don't worry two, three times. And uh, these slides are available on my website. Thank you. With this, I'm ready to take questions. Please feel free to ask me right now or send me emails uh, and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, participants, we are open for question now. If you have any question, you can write down at chat box. Yeah. Chat, okay. Yes. Uh, Somebody asked a question, how blockchain will help in waste management, okay? Uh, blockchain is a software framework, essentially, and uh, if you can find out who are the stakeholders of a waste management uh, system, for example, let us say it is uh, uh, waste from your home, okay, like coming from kitchen or coming from other rooms, and then that is going to your uh, or trash can uh, outside your home and somebody from uh, city or uh, uh, somebody is picking up so that whole supply sorry all stakeholders and the uh, what you can say the chain of things that is going on once you figure out then you can really develop system okay and already smart dustbins are available which is uh, sending text messages when it is getting filled itself so you can definitely uh, put blockchain to correlate all those and uh, by the stakeholders and uh, have it. Uh, how to use blockchain in village where public is less educated and internet connectivity is poor? That is an excellent question. So, without uh, obviously connectivity, we cannot have uh, what we are envisioning. Okay? And, uh, without uh, basically connectivity, we cannot have IoT. So that is that's a very interesting question and what I have been actually thinking in fact I am telling to many people that is uh, villages need to have some uh, what you can say low cost sustainable network which is different from what we are thinking for the cities as Wi-Fi or 5G whatever okay. So probably we have to have LoRa or another thing I always uh, talk about is Sigfox is another protocol which uh, can be a very low cost and you can uh, keep it and forget it for months that means uh, because battery life uh, it can survive for uh, uh, because each individual they are uh, um, uh, what you can say low power designs so uh, we have to have backbone network okay without connectivity we cannot have IoT and we cannot have this so blockchain in villages is a serious challenge and uh, we need to solve by having backbone network of uh, something alternative like a uh, or LoRa Uh, somebody says another question do we need hardware for pop based work or certain simulators are also available actually uh, certain simulators uh, one can do but I don't trust those uh, simulators because the whole point is uh, pop has to be hardware based and uh, hardware process variations you are essentially using uh, to or exploiting to get those responses and then use that responses for cyber security application. So if a simulator can basically create or generate those numbers, then uh, POF is not a good POF then. So that is why uh, I recommend to use hardware and my students are using FPGA because that, uh, those are easy or cheap to buy. Okay, but there are some POFs I showed one slide at least one or two companies are doing those POFs. So my recommendation will be to get those pops, okay, or get a PGS, right, VSL, very log, then with the, once you instantiate that, then use it, okay. But if you just use, let's say, LT Spice or Cadence and so on to simulate a pop, uh, I don't think that uh, 
is that reliable as a pop design. Another question, is there any energy issue in blockchain in India? Okay, answer is yes. If we use a public blockchain, okay, which are uh, quite energy in uh, intensive. In fact, I think a couple of months ago, I read an article how, uh, I live in Texas in US, right? How various uh, Bitcoin miners are ready to pay money so that uh, Texas uh, energy network can be much stronger, okay? And much reduced level, which it is, of course. But uh, whenever there is peak scenario, for example, heavy uh, snowfall or uh, very hot weather, extreme situation, their uh, domestic demand is quite a bit, house demand and so on. Then Bitcoin users that time may face problem. That is, they are ready to spend money to improve the grid so that they have more energy uh, for Bitcoin mining. So uh, yes, energy quite quite high, and probably unless uh, you know, the uh, uh, national grid is uh, strong enough, stable enough, Bitcoin mining in India and use of blockchain, original blockchain is difficult. Thank you. Okay, so I hope I answered all the questions and you can, for the questions, please feel free to email me and I'll be more than happy to answer. And uh, organizer of EIC Academy, of course, I have my contact information. Thank you. Yeah. It's time to express our gratitude. Uh, Professor Mohanty has taken trouble to be here. And, uh, has uh, two of his very informative talks, which is uh, really a information gain for us and a learning. Thank you very much, Professor Mohanty, for being with us and sparing your valuable time. Thank you very much. We'll start uh, uh, the next section in next two minutes. So I will be delivering. Uh, I know that as per the schedule that Dr. Deepak Joshi is supposed to deliver, but uh, sir has some uh, means, uh, commitment right now. So I am just preponding my lecture of uh, Sunday to today and sir will take care of on that particular day. Okay. So, uh, possibly if you want then you can take a maybe uh, two minute break and just quickly uh, come back okay meanwhile I will just uh, load my PPT and just share it okay thank you Okay. Okay. Okay.
Good evening, all of you. So, welcome back for the next session. So, I will be delivering the talk on smart healthcare technology, uh, smart healthcare for a diabetes management. So, okay. So, just. Uh, to introduce myself, so I have completed my PhD in M as well as M.Tech from SVNIT Surat. Currently working as an assistant professor at MNIT Jaipur since last nine years from 2013. Uh, my area of research is mainly smart healthcare biomedical signal processing, VLSI DSP system, embedded VLSI design. Uh, as a research profile, I have published more than 90 plus article. I have till date uh, around 900 plus Google Scholar citation. I10 index 32 and H index is 70. Uh, apart from that, I also got an honor of UGC Travel Fellowship, SERB, DHT Travel Grant and CSIR Fellowship to attend a well-known conference across the India. Uh, I was also selected as a mentor of engineering, medicine and biology in the for the students mentorship program to 2012. Apart from that, I also have a uh, I mean small start startup which is as a Swaharogya medical device registered as a MNIT incubation center. So some of the work I will uh, discuss today regarding the diabetes and how we can actually solve that problem of the diabetes. So uh, before actually jumping to our diabetes, we will talk about smart healthcare, uh, where sir has talked about many things. So I will just briefly uh, go through it. So why we require a smart healthcare? So when we look at the traditional healthcare system, okay. So when we talk about the traditional healthcare system where you require a full attention to a person who is actually being admitted into ICU. Sometimes delay in the treatment in a critical case where the person is basically admitted in ICU at that time. Absence of the support staff, maybe it could lead to a loss of a life of that particular person. When we talk about a healthcare domain, then there are so many stakeholders which are being involved. Like if I am not feeling well, then possibly I need to visit a doctor. Doctor will give me some sort of prescription. Then I, according to the prescription, I may need to go to a laboratory where I need to give a sample. Then I need to collect that report. Then again, I need to go to a doctor. Doctor will prescribe the medicine. Perhaps I need to go to a medical store to collect uh, or to purchase those medicine. So, Ultimately, there are so many stakeholders are being involved, but that is a decentralizing manner. Okay, so there is no not much interaction of each and individual stakeholder which are there in a healthcare domain. So first of all, we want to ensure that they should be connected with each other. Okay, and to be honest that when I am in pain, then I would like to reduce every bit of my efforts and I need to actually take care of my health or even if somebody of my family member are not well or is being admitted in a hospital, then possibly I would like to have my full focus for that purpose only. So when we talk about the smart healthcare technology, then in a smart healthcare technology, of course, the role of the IoT is very crucial, where we have a sensor, where sensor will collect the data from a patient. We want to continuously monitor the health of the patient this is very crucial when we talk about the chronic disease. Okay, like chronic disease is not something that will occur suddenly in your uh, body. It will gradually be developed in your body. So as early you can diagnose and uh, you can take a better preventive action for that. So basically smart healthcare is useful for a continuously health monitoring. That means I want to monitor my health parameter in day to day life then it could also help in having a some sort of healthcare automation, drug delivery mechanism 
and ultimately in a preventive healthcare mechanism. So when I use a IoT in a medical domain, then sometimes it is being defined as a medical internet of thing or internet of medical things. Okay. So now where we have a sensor which will collect the data, we can analyze those data and we can take some sort of preventive action for some of the disease and ultimately it would be providing a very good solution to have a some sort of remote monitoring like if my parents is sick then possibly I can monitor it from a remote location from my job also and I can take care of and actually I can track the health of my, my parents who are actually residing at my home. So basically when I use a healthcare domain where I have some sort of software and then I have some sort of controlling capability with some sort of embedded hardware and that overall system is basically with term as a healthcare cyber physical system or cyber physical system in medical okay so these are the important term that are basically used is interchangeably manner now we will talk about the different components of the smart healthcare like M health, connected health or E health. So what is the role of the smart healthcare? Okay, smart healthcare as we have seen that it is very important to play a very important role. Now, but how I can adopt the smart healthcare in my day to day life? Okay, so there are some components through which we can adapt the smart healthcare in our day to day life. E health, M health, telemedicine, connected health, However, role of ICT is very crucial in a healthcare domain. So in a smart healthcare, basically whenever I place a sensor to capture the physiological data from a patient, then that data, whatever is being generated, that we used to term as an electronic health record. Now this electronic health record is very important. Okay, because it is some sort of personalized data that we are capturing from a particular patient and according to that we can actually have a personalized treatment. Okay, so where we can actually analyze them and we can infer them through, through some sort of AI ML models and we can take a better precautionary action which is dedicated to that particular patient. Now when we talk about a smart healthcare attributes then of course, whatever the solution that we would like to adapt, it should have a very good sensing capability. It should work to all the environment. It should be always on. That means the power management is all one of the crucial aspect. Apart from that, it should be a multifunctional. Multifunctional that means, ki, see if I want to capture, let's say, multiple parameters from my body but it's not necessary that that many number of sensor I need to wear it okay so ultimately I would like to have a sensor which could able to capture the multiple parameter from my body and through which I can able to take the better decision so characteristic when I then talk about then smart healthcare solution should be adaptive intelligent it should have a transparency context aware and it should be sensitive. Now features of smart healthcare when I can consider then through a smart healthcare the important thing is doctor and patient could connect with each other through a remote location. Of course the continuous monitoring for a critical condition is possible. You can take the corrective action as well as the quality of the care could be possible with the proper diagnosis. You can access the real-time health record through a smart healthcare. That means it is as good as that you are physically monitoring the patient. Okay, so the point of care service and medication through intelligent consumer devices is possible in a smart healthcare. Now, when we talk about a smart healthcare, then there are various kind of consumer products which are available in the market. Like they are in terms of the smart watch, smart ring fitness tracker, smart bell. So all these kind of solutions are available in the market. Now, these are the variable device which are becoming more and more popular in a nowadays. Okay. However, there are certain issues with them like the precision and reliability. Okay. Because these kind of solutions are of course good that they can capture the day-to-day -day activity and day-to-day -day physiological parameter. But 
the problem in the adoption is that they are not giving a precision which is being expected specifically when we talk about the healthcare domain in a healthcare domain the accuracy is important because whatever the data that you are capturing according to that you are taking a some critical decision so those data should be accurate enough on which we can process and we can infer the data of course the reliability is issue sometimes they are not working so ultimately we need to ensure that they should be able to capture the data throughout my daily activity okay so that means the power management is also one of the challenge that, that we need to be addressed so such kind of consumer electronics are available which can easily measure your ecg heart rate spo2 even how much you have run for that also the fitness trackers are there now we will talk about the components that we are looking for for a smart healthcare okay so one of the component is a e health so e health is whenever i use a ict technology information and communication technology in my healthcare domain then i can term them as a e health now through a e health we can generate a very informative health information that we can transmit to a remotely located health professional maybe we can transmit it to a doctor caretaker or hospital management people so that they can also keep track of, of a health now such kind of solution is very useful particularly in a country like us where we have a very huge population and per patient the number of doctor is very less okay so for that we can adopt a such kind of technology where still a doctor could monitor a health condition of a particular patient which are in icu from his device itself okay so where there is a no geographical barriers are there so telemedicine is one of the very important concept which is being developed and especially during the covid where we have a certain restriction for the movement so at that time for the routine check up also it would be very difficult for a patient to visit a doctor and even doctors are reluctant to meet a patient in person so at that time through some sort of technological solution the doctor and patient could be connected and the doctor can provide the telemedicine m health m health is a very important and a very crucial component okay so whenever we use a mobile phone in a healthcare domain then we used to term that is a m health solution okay where we have a mobile devices which can collect the data and it will also allow us to capture the some sort of useful information from a patient so it will also provide the information to a practitioner researcher via in terms of the sms or simply mobile application okay so one of the such application which is being developed in 2014 which is we term as a m hero now m hero is a one of the application which is being developed by a unicef during the crisis of the ebola in african country okay where they used to make or they used to send some public awareness message during those time and we consider a mobile phone is a easiest component through which one can easily reach to a mass people okay so m health is one of the very critical solution which are available even real time monitoring of the patient vital sign is possible with the mobile phone so mobile phone m health application is you can have a rapid collection and sharing of the data of course to give the sample i can go to a laboratory but possibly the result of the laboratory i can have on my mobile phone itself okay for that no need to go for a laboratory personally and that particular lab report i can easily exchange with my uh, means doctor through any social media application so public health and lifestyle message could be easily sent through a mobile okay even during the covid we are actually habitual to having some of the mobile phone application like arogya setu is one of the most popular application even the covin is the mobile application that you can use it. okay where the scheduling of the vaccination maybe 
your uh, certification you can download very easily so medication alert could be also sent through a mobile phone possibly for the vaccination you are getting a message that your vaccination is due in next couple of day or maybe in next few days your vaccination is due so such kind of message could be easily sent through a mobile phone e prescription could be sent through a mobile phone telemonitoring is possible where a patient result could be easily shared by a clinician to a doctor or a healthcare person transmission of the test result through be very popular or very easily you can do it through some sort of mobile app as well as through a sms service now connected health this is one of the very important and very essential component of your healthcare domain so through connected health you would be able to connect a different stakeholder of your healthcare domain and that is very much important in your smart healthcare so when i when i consider a patient is in critical condition so at that time i need to avoid to explain each and everything to every stakeholder of a healthcare domain so that means that possibly whatever the health report and the health record it should be seamlessly available to my doctor from a laboratory person that means laboratory reports are ready then ultimately that it has to be transmitted to a doctor and doctor should easily able to access those record even the doc doctor prescription should be available to a medical shop okay so when i visit a medical store at that time it is not necessary that i need to carry a prescription with me the doctor prescription should be av available to a pharmaceutical people and through which the i can easily able to get the medicine okay the biggest advantage that could be possible with the connected health care in a health insurance mechanism okay where i should able to claim my health insurance very easily currently what is the policy in our country specifically whenever you are being admitted to a particular hospital for a particular treatment then you should be there in a hospital for a certain amount of the time usually they decide they have consider that one day hospital admission is necessary so in that particular period one of the insurance company people will check you your physical condition and according to that your insurance claim will be passed okay but if the connected health system will be placed in a very well manner then what happens that once i am being admitted in a particular hospital then that hospital will enter the data against my name or particular digital health id against that id my data is available that data could be easily shared to a insurance company people and my insurance claim would be passed within no time okay so ultimately this such kind of system would be actually we will be helpful to a healthcare domain where seamlessly the data could be exchanged of the various among the various stakeholder which are being there in a healthcare domain now such kind of system is very well placed in european country and as well as in a usa initial level but still means we are far away for this but possibly uh, means uh, before 2 years at the time of the address our prime minister has emphasized that in india shortly each individual would have a one particular digital health id okay so with this digital health id will be unique for each an individual like a aadhar card or maybe it could be integrated with the aadhar card also so with that id all the person histories are available like if i consult a one particular doctor then he should have a accessible of data that what is the history of that particular patient that before 2 years if i have something of uh, if i have uh, means something operation is being done or some surgery is being done then doctor should be aware about it whenever he want to prescribe a particular medicine so with the connected health network with having a particular unique id where all the information is available for a patient 
could be very well placed with the C health component. So with the C health component, of course, the telemedicine and it have a very huge impact in a healthcare domain. So IoT is definitely a playing a very crucial role for having a health monitoring, specifically in a fitness tracker where you can measure your blood pressure, pulse oximeter, pedometer. So these are the available. Okay. Now I will talk about one of the application where currently I am working extensively and even whatever the startup that I have, that is also basically developing a product regarding the diabetes care. Okay. So that I will brief you about in a next around 30, 35 minutes. Now, when we talk about a condition of the diabetic patient, then it is actually the number is very scary. Okay. And diabetes is one of the main challenge of this particular decade, even for a developed country also. So if I look at the diabetic pa patient figure, then currently around 450 million people are suffering from a diabetic. Now, if you are a diabetic patient, then for you, you need to measure your blood glucose. Okay. Because you need to control it and then you need to follow some strict diet plan. Okay. But for that, the first thing is you should be able to measure your blood glucose well. Now, being a diabetic, actually it is advisable that you need to recurrently measure your blood glucose, ideally two, three times in a day. Okay. But if I look at the solution which are available, then one thing is I can measure a blood glucose through some sort of self-monitoring device which are invasive in nature. Okay. However, with the blood breaking from my body, it would be very inconvenient to adopt it for a longer duration. And sometimes with that scare of pricking up blood from my body, I used to avoid of a recurrent blood glucose measurement. But being a diabetic patient, you need to take care of having a recurrent blood glucose measurement. Now, when we talk about the diabetes, then diabetes is actually a root cause of so many diseases. Okay, so once your blood glucose is remaining high for a longer duration, then you are actually inviting so many diseases inside your body. Like you can have Alzheimer, you can have a hearing impairment, you can have a retinal problem, you can have a cardiovascular disease, disease. that means the heart attack, which is one of the prominent reason of the death among the even the youngster now. So for that, the high blood glucose is a, one of the cause for that. Okay. Skin disease, kidney damage, food damage, nerve system damage. So all are disease having a root cause of high blood glucose value. So diabetes is basically a root cause for that. Now when we talk about the diabetes, then I can actually have a, or I can infer the diabetes or predict the diabetes with some sort of early symptoms, okay, that we need to take care. So when I talk about some of the symptoms of the diabetes, like somebody have a excursion of urine in a short duration, okay, and somebody is feeling consistently hung hungriness and thirstiness, some unexpected weight loss, tiredness, even your vision could changes, okay. Maybe you can have a problem with the heart. So you can have a problem with the kidney. So all these are a symptoms of being a diabetic patient. So when a person enters into the diabetes, then the chances of a death is 50% and higher than a non-diabetic patient. Okay. So when we talk about the India, then in India, around more than 70 million people are currently suffering from a diabetes. Okay. And mainly they are of a type 2 diabetes. Now, when I talk about the diabetes, then diabetes is actually being of mainly three types. Okay. However, the main are a two diabetes. The third one is a gestational diabetes that is basically for a pregnant woman and that is a temporary diabetes. Once a woman 
enter into a, his pregnancy period at that time the diabetes temporarily would be affecting and that is a gestational diabetes now for this diabetes it is though it is a temporary but if you are not taking a precautionary action then there is likely case that you may enter into the type 1 and type 2 diabetes now type 1 diabetes is a diabetes where body is not able to generate your any kind of insulin and type 2 diabetes is a diabetes where body is able to generate the insulin but not the sufficient one okay so if you are a diabetic patient then there is no harm for your sugar but there is a problem with your pancreas where it is not able to generate the insulin okay now see glucose is very important component of our body now if you just observe it that whenever uh, means uh, somebody is admitted in a hospital then the first thing that doctor will do that they will put you on your glucose okay so that means they will want to ensure that your body has enough glucose well but higher value of the glucose is creating a problem so if your body is having the excess amount of the glucose then we term them is a uh, hyperglycemia okay so hyperglycemia is nothing but the diabetes where body is having a higher value of the glucose so ideally we would like to have a blood glucose value inside the body which is typically in the range of 70 80 to 150 okay so usually you should have a blood glucose value around 100 or less than 100 before taking a meal after taking a meal you could have a variation from 110 to 140 so ultimately the glucose is important but when the glucose goes beyond 140 or 150 then that is a problem and that we term as a diabetes condition as i said that glucose is very important in our body so whenever you take some food at that time the in your pancreas there are two particular cell the role of alpha and beta cell is very important the alpha cell from this food generate the glucagon hormone and beta cell would generate the insulin hormone now inside your pancreas the balance of this glucose and insulin is very important if your pancreas is working very fine then it will always try to neutralize the excessive amount of the glucose which is being generated through your food but if your pancreas is not working properly then maybe the insulin generation is not being done enough that we consider as a type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes is a condition where your pancreas is almost generating a new insulin which is nothing okay so there is nothing like insulin which is being generated inside the body so a type 1 diabetic patient then you need to take the insulin or insulin injection okay type 2 diabetic patient they can actually means control the diabetic by following some specific lifestyle by changing their food habit by having some exercise or taking some sort of medicine but if you are entering into the type 1 diabetes where the insulin is not at all generated so that means you need to take an insulin injection okay so maybe if you have observed any type 1 diabetes patient then type 1 diabetes patient used to take an insulin injection before taking a meal so what they want to ensure that they want to ensure that that they are taking an insulin now whenever any food comes into your pancreas then you have an insulin which would be able to neutralize your excessive amount of the blood glucose which are being generated through a alpha cell okay so that is very important so that's why they used to take the insulin priorly so that the neutralization could be done in a very well manner now for a diabetic patient the, when we talk about the glucose value because glucose value keep on changing because it as i said it, it depends upon your lifestyle what you eat so it will keep on changing like 
whatever the blood glucose value right now may be at 8 o'clock my blood glucose value is different okay so ultimately being a diabetic patient you need to adopt a practice of continuous glucose monitor or at least recurrent glucose monitoring that means i need to measure my body blood glucose continuously throughout the day ideally i should able to have a knowledge of my blood glucose of each and individual point of time inside my body okay so for that the continuous glucose monitoring practice is very important now when i talk about the continuous glucose monitoring practice then what are the current solution that we are have okay so when we took look at the current solution then we used to measure the blood glucose of either of two way okay the first way is we can go to a laboratory where we can give a blood sample and through this blood sample i could able to get the blood glucose value okay but now again to visit a laboratory maybe two three times in a day or maybe frequently it is very painful okay apart from that the second method is you can have a self monitoring device okay so there are n number of self monitoring device which are available in the market through which you can take uh, take out the blood sample on uh, one particular simple strip like you can just see it on your first picture that there is a lancet through which you can puncture your finger now that blood what is coming out that you can put it for your strip and that strip you need to insert into the one particular device and through which you can able to measure the blood glucose value okay however whatever the blood glucose value that you measure with this particular approach that is a capillary blood glucose value that may not be a necessary that give a exact value of your body blood glucose value okay even doctor will not give you a uh, advice to go for a such kind of matter frequently because they will give you they will not be accurate enough when you visit a laboratory then you would be able to measure the serum blood glucose value serum blood glucose value that means whenever you give a blood sample to a laboratory then from their blood sample they used to put them in a one particular temperature chamber through this process they are able to bifurcate some of the solid particles which are available inside your uh, blood they will be at the bottom after uh, means uh, putting them into a temperature chamber and at the top you have a some sort of transparent uh, water part or it is looks like a water which we consider as a plasma and through which whatever the glucose is being measured that is being considered as a serum glucose so serum glucose is considered to be accurate than your capillary glucose so if you want to take a better diabetes control mechanism then you should be able to measure your body blood glucose throughout the day and it should be more closely towards the serum glucose now both the method require a puncturing of a body part okay so this is not convenient and specifically when i consider a diabetes diabetes comes with the age so if a person once it is enter into the 60 or 70 at that time the frequent puncturing even a finger is not a advisable it could create a trauma effect also so we need to think about a some sort of non invasive blood glucose measurement solution which could help us to solve the purpose okay where from a outer body surface that means i need, do not have to puncture anything inside my body from my body outer surface only i should able to measure the blood glucose and that we consider as a non invasive glucose measurement solution and that solution is always advisable for a continuous glucose measurement now when i adopt the invasive glucose measurement solution then i can get the intermediate value of my blood glucose that means whenever i take out the blood sample from my body at that moment whatever my blood glucose value that i can measure but after 30 minutes after 40 minutes if my blood glucose value has changed then that information i am not able to aware it 
so for a better diabetes management control you should in short adopt for a non invasive glucose measurement approach now we have used the optical detection method for measurement of blood glucose in our research so basically when we talk about the glucose molecule then it is basically formation of ch and o bond only okay so ultimately we are using a optical detection method where light will be incident into your body part so particularly for our case we have used a fingertip so light will be incident onto a fingertip and at the receiver end we are measuring a intensity of the light in terms of the photo detector and the photo detector current will vary according to the blood glucose which is being present inside the body so light will be incident and at the receiver end we are having a photo diode which will capture the intensity of that particular light so if there is a some glucose particle which is being there inside your body then whatever the light intensity which supposed to receive that would vary okay and through which you can able to measure the blood glucose concentration of your body so basically in order to measure because now the choice of the optical source is very important okay so we thought of carrying out the experiment with the led because it is the cheapest solution which are available okay but now what would be the wavelength of the led that we need to measure okay so that has to be in sync with the able to measure the blood glucose of your body okay so for that we have done some experiment at our laboratory we have a material research center over here where we have a very good facility so over there ni spectrometer is there okay so we have used the parkinson elmer lambda 750 uv vis nir spectrometer where we have taken a different different samples so that means we have taken a refined glucose powder that actually we consider as a dextrone monohydrate that is a pure glucose which are available in the market that we have taken and we have taken a distilled water sample now we are adding a certain quantity of the glucose inside the water like 5g 10g and 15g glucose inside the water we are measuring the spectra so we are we have measured the spectra of the distilled water and in comparison of we are measuring the spectra of where inside the water 5g 10g and 15g glucose are being added and through which we are able to measure at which particular wavelength the glucose could be identified so we through our experiment we have identified that 940 and 1300 nanometer are two wavelength at which the glucose particle could be identified so ultimately the experiment that we have done that this is just a plot over there you just observed that at 940 and 1300 we are getting some sort of peak okay and that we have considered for our experiment so we have used a led source of 940 and 1300 nanometer where we are using the absorption as well as a reflectance spectroscopy so ultimately at 940 we are able to have a absorption and reflectance spectroscopy and 1300 only we have adopted the absorption by adding the reflectance at 1300 we have observed that we are not getting any kind of accuracy in terms of the prediction so that's why we have used only a three sensor approach where at the 940 we are taking care of the absorption and 940 we are taking care of the reflectance and at 1300 we are taking care of the absorption so that three wavelength led we are using so possibly in the picture you just see at the top that three sensor we are using it okay so this yellow sensor is for the absorption and your uh, means white sensor is for the reflectance okay so we are measuring the light intensity at the receiver end as well as at the transmitter end when there is a reflectance which is possible so that data we have logged it in terms of the voltage value and that voltage value we are providing to our machine learning model where we are using a regression okay now we are actually getting a reference value from whatever available standard fda approved glucometer that means we have used a self monitoring device specifically acucheck 
for the calibration purpose that we have used as a gold standard and whatever the voltage value that we are trying to map it through the regression model and through which we have created the model which will help you to estimate the blood glucose value at any point of time okay and that performance parameter is also we are able to measure so that device we are term is as a IGU that is intelligent glucometer okay so through this intelligent glucometer we are able to measure the blood glucose value accurately so this is just a experimental setup that we have used the dual wave NIS spectroscopy we have adopted as I said that 940 absorption and reflection spectroscopy and 1300 meter, meter we have absorption spectroscopy so these three channel data that we are using so that means you need to have a this is the actually acquisition model that we have created to capture the sample value from your real subject and we have used the Arduino through which actually we are doing a data logging okay so with this we are capturing the value from a tree sensor and this tree sensor through which the regression model we are able to estimate the blood glucose value so this would be very useful for a self glucose measurement where you can able to measure the blood glucose value whenever you want to measure simply you need to insert your finger inside the sensor and through which you can actually non-invasively continuously monitor your blood glucose value apart from that whatever the sensor value that we are being captured that we are pushing those value to the cloud so those sensor value will definitely give you the indication of whatever the blood glucose value is there so even before two weeks back or before two months back whatever my blood glucose value that can I can easily check it out and according to that I can have a better prescription or diabetes management plan for me so this is the three channel data that I am talking about 1300 is a absorption channel 2 and channel 3 is for a reflectant as well as a absorption so here uh, means uh, regression model will help you to get the blood glucose estimation now as, as we discussed just now the serum glucose measurement is very important okay so that means you should able to capture your serum glucose value which actually considered to be a more closer value of your body blood glucose so for that also we have actually means uh, attached with the one of the hospitals where uh, means uh, we are able to uh, get the serum blood glucose value from a hospital experiment and that we have used at a calibration purpose with our three sensor and through which whatever the model that we have created that is able to measure the serum blood glucose value of the body so that we are considering as an upgraded version of iglu so that we term as a iglu 2 so through which we are able to measure the blood glucose value accurately which is more close to your body blood glucose now we have taken a or we have conducted the laboratory experiment for a certain samples so where we have considered the pre diabetic patient diabetic patient and healthy sample to so just ensure that we have a subject for whole range and through which we are able to train our model so that the prediction would be accurate in each and every range so we have typically considered 197 samples and through which we are able to measure the capillary and blood glucose value now whenever you are coming up with any particular concept where you are able to measure or estimate the blood glucose then always you need to look for a validation okay so for a blood glucose measurement device the validation is always a Clark error read analysis okay so this is uh, Clark has basically developed one concept where there is a grid kind of structure where you have a reference blood glucose value and an estimated blood glucose value now if your reference blood glucose value is matching with the estimated blood glucose value then you will get some sort of linear curve over here and your readings will be in zone A whenever you are getting a reading in a zone A where your estimated blood glucose value is matching with your reference blood glucose value then in a zone A it is considered to be your device is clinically accurate where in zone B and zone C your reading is there at that time it requires that there is some sort of correction which is required okay and B and E is a dangerous to be actually used in a for a real subject okay so whatever the reading that we have got that is 
all the reading of 197 are in zone A. So which consider that that our device is clinically accurate. Okay. So ultimately we have able to measure our performance in terms of some quantified value. So this MARD, average E, MARD, R value all are just parameter which nothing but gives you the information about how closely your estimation to with your reference value that is a golden standard that you have okay so we have conducted the experiment on human blood and through which we are able to measure the performance and you just observe that that through our model we are able to get the minimum error with the gold reference value now ultimately non-invasive glucose measurement will give you the indication of your blood glucose value but always when we talk about a healthcare domain in a smart healthcare solution then we should have a closed loop solution so what i mean by closed loop solution that means once you are able to identify that one particular person is having a high blood glucose value then through some sort of closed loop mechanism you should also have a some sort of remedial action for that okay so that's what we have worked on that automatic diabetic care for a type 1 diabetes if you remember that uh, insulin injection is very important okay now currently most of the people what they are following the practice that they used to take a prescribed insulin dosage every day before taking a meal okay irrespective of whatever my blood glucose went okay so what is the ideal scenario according to whatever your current blood glucose you need to decide whatever the insulin amount is required for your body okay but we are not following that practice right now so what we are proposing that through our non-invasive glucometer iglu you could be able to measure the blood glucose value continuously that will be integrated with your insulin pump now the insulin pump will decide what amount of the insulin has to be injected inside your body now for that the glucometer is integrated with the insulin pump inside the insulin pump there is a some sort of mathematical model which will estimate the insulin amount to your body according to your current blood glucose okay so automatically insulin could be injected inside the body or even a doctor can suggest you the prescribed solution of a insulin according to whatever your current blood glucose will and through which you can manage your diabetes very well okay so basically we need to develop a glucose insulin model which will work as an artificial pancreas where the role of to generate a insulin according to the whatever the glucose value okay so that mathematical model also we have developed that we consider as an artificial pancreas system okay so this will be well useful for a diabetic patient okay so through this solution ultimately we are trying to develop the close diabetes care mechanism where the non-invasive glucometer is being integrated with the insulin pump and the amount of the insulin to be injected inside the body is dynamically keep on changing okay so whenever your body is having an excess amount of blood glucose then automatically the insulin pump will decide that now i need to secrete the insulin so that i can neutralize the excess amount of the blood blood glucose inside the body so this is the simple thing that we were trying to develop the closed loop glucose insulin model where i already ex ex uh, explained that the alpha cell is basically generating a glucagon which you just consider as a glucose and beta cell is for the insulin secretion so ultimately the balance form of the glucose and insulin inside the body is very much important so basically that glucose insulin mathematical model has been developed and that actually we have also conducted the experiment with the help of the doctor on a real subject how our model is working so currently this experiment is very well being taken in a research community by FDA approved UA Padova simulator okay so this UA Padova simulator is there 
but that is not the free one okay you need to pay some fee in order to get the access of this simulator and through which the virtual simulation you can perform and through which also you can actually verify your glucose insulin model okay but what we have done that we have actually done the experiment on a real subject where through a secretion of the insulin through our model we then able to measure the blood glucose value of that patient before insulin secretion and after insulin secretion and through which we are able to judge that our model is correctly balancing the glycemic profile of a particular patient okay so we have uh, in order to establish uh, develop that glucose model we have considered the various parameter that glucose absorption rate your urine excursion rate so all these things are being considered and with that we have uh, developed a glucose insulin model so that is our automatic glucose insulin mechanism is being taken care through a artificial pancreas system so this is overall proposed iomt framework that we are actually develop where if you are a hyperglycemia state where your blood glucose is higher then through some sort of glucose insulin model you are trying to neutralize your excess amount of the glucose of your body of course when you have a norm, normal blood glucose or even you, you are in a hypoglycemia case where your body blood glucose is lesser than 70 then actually you do not have to worry about anything of secreting a insulin but of course whenever your glucose value is lesser inside your body that we consider as a hypoglycemia that is very critical condition okay your you will be tend to lose your mental stability with decreasing the blood glucose value so if your blood glucose value is less than 40 or less than 50 then possibly you can have a mental imbalance inside the body okay so that is more dangerous hypoglycemia case is a more dangerous okay but currently our focus is for the hyperglycemia case where we consider a diabetes condition and through which how you can control the body blood glucose so these are some of the result of our glucose insulin model where we are able to actually measure the performance through a real subject of course we have only consider a four patient of uh, in our study but through which also we are able to prove that whatever the glucose insulin model that we have developed that are actually working very well in order to neutralize excess amount of the glucose of your body so this is actually no need to actually discuss it more already uh, the mohanty sir has already uh, discussed about this so this we have done in a collaboration where we have also developed some sort of security mechanism for a uh, our insulin model now uh, in next uh, five ten minutes i will mainly talk about the covid related stuff because the covid is covid 19 is also closely related to the diabetic because we have enough case study where it comes out that 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 covid is infecting that sars virus is infecting more to a diabetes patient okay so even when we look at the history then diabetic patients are more vulnerable for any kind of virus if i talk about mars virus h1n1 or even sars virus which came in 2013 okay so diabetic patients have a higher threat of infection from any kind of virus okay so 20 to 50 percentage of the overall cases are you will observe that the diabetic patient which are being infected by covid 19 now why this is basically happening okay so any kind of virus will be much mutated okay that mutation rate is very high where you have a high blood glucose value okay so with that the uh, genomic structure of the virus is more increasing when uh, you have a higher blood glucose value okay now when we talk about the covid 19 study in a covid 19 study if you look at the number then the heart patients are more likely to be affected then the second one is a diabetes then those who are having some respiratory issue and of course the hypertension 
okay high blood pressure people are being affected through this particular covid 19 virus okay now when i talk about a diabetic patient then in a diabetic patient you will find out the unbalanced glucose insulin inside the body okay and with this it will increase the level of decay decay is one kind of uh, you can consider protein that you can observe inside your body okay and your sars cov is having a higher affinity of ac2 okay that is a one kind of you can consider enzyme or protein which is being present inside the body in every part of the body you will find out this kind of protein okay so the affinity rate of sars cov2 virus is 10 to 20 times more than the previous virus that's why this virus is spreading like a means a, a very widely okay and it is being infecting very widely throughout the world okay because the affinity rate is more than the previous virus okay and as i said that the virus always love to be populated more when you have a higher blood glucose value okay so of course when you are a diabetic patient then of course the chances of the covid 19 is more with the lockdown you have also observed that 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 diabetic patient are not able to visit the routine laboratory visit regularly of course during the lockdown the anxiety of the people have also be more and they have more negative thought specifically in a lockdown where the people stuck at some particular place where they are away from their family okay and such kind of emotion is also affecting your glycemic profile okay your insulin generation and with that also the chances of having a covid 19 are more okay so of course when we talk about this diabetic of a self management there are there are some barriers that we need to overcome like we are not that much of confident about our self care mechanism okay we are, so we are very much habitual to visit the doctor okay of course the proper diet plan you need to follow because being a diabetic patient you need to ensure that what you need to eat what you do not need to eat okay so these are the some sort of self mechanism that we need to take care okay now when we when we talk 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 take care of our diabetes with the covid 19 then they are as i said that closely related even from the figure also you can just observe it if you just check out the figure there's there that those who are being those country which are being affected badly by covid 19 okay so those are usa india brazil france russia china and if you look at the number of diabetic population okay worldwide then these are the five major player of the diabetic patient okay and those are the one who are being badly affected by covid 19 so this actually uh, data are enough to prove that 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 diabetic being a diabetic patient you need to take care of yourself extra okay so so with this i would like to conclude my session so ultimately for a diabetic patient the smart health care is very much required where you can have a, some sort of adoption of ict and iot in your diabetes management system of course the data which is being generated from a sensor which could be useful which through which you can take some sort of decision like through a glucometer you can take a decision of how, what what amount of the insulin which is being required by your body okay of course there are some challenges that we need to address before that such kind of solution are available in the market okay lastly in the last two minutes i will just try to show a small demo of whatever the solution of non invasive glucose measurement that we have developed okay so i am just uh, sharing my screen uh, now possibly i need to open the app so maybe i am just stop sharing it i am just opening a different application where uh, possibly i can run my video
okay just let me share my screen again so that I can show you the video I think video is visible to you video is visible okay so ultimately if you just observe that this is the device that we have developed it looks like like a pulse oximeter okay so ultimately these are the sensor reading which are being captured through our glucometer so you just observe that that, that sensor is actually giving you some value which is in the range of the 15,000 okay so currently whatever the demo that I am showing you that is for a single sensor okay 940 nanometer only okay so currently we are reducing the sensor in order to make a very good product which could be appealing to a customer okay so that uh, one sensor device that we have developed and you just observe that, that that this sensor is giving me a constant value of the 15,000 okay now this value are we are capturing in our excel sheet and this excel sheet we are putting it inside our regression model so this is the excel sheet which are being generated you just observe that the sensor value is almost similar okay so this sensor or this excel which is being generated through data logging that we used to supply as an input to our regression model so we have written a one particular python script where the regression model is there so this excel value we are supplying and through this you just observe that we are using three prediction model okay so decision tree gaussian and random forest okay so for us the decision trees we found is a more accurate you just observe that it is giving 87 as a blood glucose value now this i am measuring at the same time with the two self monitoring device okay so we have adopted the AcuCheck and doctor trust these two devices we are using it so this is the same subject which has put the finger now through finger printing okay just to validate that whether our result is correct or not so this is the blood sample that we have captured now this is the AcuCheck device okay through this AcuCheck we are measuring our blood glucose now you just observe that 93 so our model is predicting 87 this is 93 okay now this is another device which is a doctor truss through which we are measuring our blood glucose value so I am just taking a blood sample now through which you are just observing the data so you just observe that through this second glucometer we are getting 90 okay and our model has predicted 87 okay so our model is or whatever our device through which we are able to capture 90 to 90 at least 90 90 percentage accuracy okay even we are getting more than 95 percentage accuracy for the healthy patient but overall accuracy if we are getting that is, that is a 90 percent okay so these devices are actually means being prepared by in conjunction of our whatever the startup that we have developed now for that we have also received a funding from the dsc msme and meti so through which now we are actually trying to have a commercialization for that okay so with this i am ending up our my session i am now more than welcome to answer your queries okay so i am just reading it maybe you can write it down at your chat box so for the canvas i already said my video so i mean till yesterday all the videos are there in a canvas okay so is there any doubt or possibly whatever the query that you can put it at your chat box i will be more than happy to answer those queries So there is a chat box as well as a question answer session. So if you have any query then please write down at a chat box. If there is no query then possibly we can end up the session. Okay. Apart from that if you have anything to discuss with me. How to open canvas sir. Uh, I think at least we can talk it later uh, separately. Maybe tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock session I can solve your query for the canvas I will send the canvas invitation also so my email id possibly is there sir can we use multiple leads for detecting a blood sample multiple leads means I am not getting see when we are collecting a blood sample then there are two things which we require 
one is a line set okay that is required that line set through line set you are puncturing your finger and then possibly you are taking a blood out of it and from through non invasive blood glucometer you are actually means a uh, uh, with the strip you are measuring your blood glucose okay so one strip you need to use for the line set you can use a multiple time as far as it is for a same subject but if you are changing the subject and you need to change the line set also okay can our regression model is always less than the predicted value or more than that so it is uh, it is not sure okay means that you can be having a more value or lesser value so actually if it is a lesser value then you can consider it is more accurate because your capillary glucose is always higher than your serum glucose okay so if a monitoring device whatever is there available in the market through which you are getting a blood glucose value 90 dre then your serum glucose value is definitely lesser than that that is sure okay so your capillary glucose is higher than your serum glucose yes any further question if there is no question then we can end up the session thank you for joining for day 5 tomorrow there is an announcement that we are having a lecture at the morning 10 10 to 1 and 3 to 5 we have a lecture schedule okay for the same i will send the mail today okay so tomorrow we have a lecture and there is a slight change in a of course a schedule so that also i will send you okay so thank you all of you for a joining today see you tomorrow again bye thank you